The following is an excerpt from my latest blog, Babe, Pig in the Apocalypse, a Cornish pastiche, a zombie chronicle by David K. Roberts, copyright 2014, all rights reserved. This is a work of fiction. Chapter 1. The Beginning of the End A bacon sarny. How can you say that in front of... The horse paused for a moment, nodding his head sideways to indicate the little piglet standing in a circle of friends. Him, he finished. I'm just saying it like it is, the cat Sid argued, while at the same time smiling slyly. It smells good, too. You never could resist eating that. You bastard, Quackers the Duck shouted, wading into Babe's defence. With a flap of his wings, he sent the cat flying from its perch. It ran away. That's right, fuck off, he finished, flipping the cat the bird. You're one tough hombre, aren't you? The duck's girlfriend cooed, which wasn't easy for a duck. Her name was Salma, and she was the sexiest animal on the farm. Her eyelashes were longer than could ever have been imagined on a duck, and her eyes had that come-hither stare that made Quacker's heart skip a beat. The fact that she couldn't blink, accounting for the glassy stare, didn't put him off. He couldn't figure out why she'd stayed with him all these months. Till death us do part, he thought, which might be sooner than any of them had ever considered. I hate that fucking cat, don't you? The cow, Trude, added. He's always going on about my bony hips, says there's nothing to hang on to. Bastard. What's bacon? A little voice piped up from well below their average head height. The horse, Goliath, looked down with sad eyes and a long face. He always had sad eyes, and his face was always long. It's just the way he was. Nothing at all, young fellow, my lad. Let's leave the farmer and his wife to their breakfast. As for me, I've got some oats with my name on them. On the grains, Babe asked. Unfortunately for him, when he was being particularly dim-witted, his inner monologue almost never kicked in, usually making matters worse. Duh, a feline voice could be heard in the distance. The question ignored, each animal went on their way. Babe and the sheepdog, Shep, the farmer was noted for his originality, ambled over to the barn and lay down in the hay and snuggled up, spooning with the dog's front paw over Babe's shoulder. We should never have started this, Babe whispered quietly. It's only natural, Shep said. That's not what the others say, Babe replied, feeling downhearted. He'd always believed in the innate goodness of animal kind, right up until he'd announced their love that could not be named. Not that they wouldn't, it's just that it had no name in anyone's language. What do they say? They say things like, it's bad enough we're going into species, but the same sex as well. It seems like we've just started our own minority group of two. Oh yes, and something about using the word pork as a verb. I didn't get that one. They're just jealous. Goliath stands out in the field in all weather, dumb as a stump, that one. Quackers, well, he's just quackers. And the rest, they simply don't count. The sheeps are just too stupid. After a while, they doze blissfully. Shep raised his head. He'd heard something. Getting up quietly to investigate, he left Babe on the straw, most of which was on his side. Again, if there was one complaint... Mustn't get distracted, he chastised himself, and went outside to investigate the cause of his premature arousal, a rare occurrence since he'd met Babe. Everything seemed to be okay, so far. A cry came from the farmhouse. It sounded like the farmer's wife. Running to the back door, he was just in time to see the farmer himself burst outside, blood all over his front, and carrying a hand in one hand and a meat cleaver in the other. A hand? Shep ran over to him, but the master just used the extra appendage to take swipes at him. Easily dodging these pitiful attacks, he dove indoors to check out the old girl. If that was her way of giving him a hand, Shep reckoned their marriage wasn't going to last much longer. He skidded to a halt on the linoleum floor. There was blood everywhere, and poor old Mrs. Farmer just lay there groaning quietly, while blood pumped from the stump that would definitely have looked better with the hand in situ. Ah, that explains it, Shep realised, his brain finally whirring up to full speed. And sitting there, cool as a cucumber next to the wife, was that bloody cat calmly looking at the ever-increasing pool of blood, almost like it was its right. Still, Sid the perfect bastard cat was her favourite creature on the whole farm, so perhaps his action could be viewed as accepting its inheritance. Never one to waste an opportunity, and considering his lunch was late, or so his stomach was telling him, the sheepdog began lapping at the pulsing blood, relishing the warmth as it flowed onto his tongue. Small hoofbeats on the kitchen floor made him look around. Babe had walked in, leaving the cutest little cloven hoof marks drawn in blood. How sweet! What's going on? Babe asked. Why has the master done this? He seems angry to me. No shit. What gave you that idea? Shep quipped. He was always like this when his sleep was interrupted without good reason. He carried on drinking. Babe just looked hurt and said nothing. He was a sensitive soul, a little beef-headed, but that was the price he paid for his good looks. He couldn't have everything in life. There are some other people coming up the road, Babe announced. They look just like the master. What, that ugly? That explains why you never see big herds of them roaming the countryside, Shep retorted while continuing to drink the blood. Waste not, want not, he thought. They were only people, now to do with him, and no mistake. Mrs. Farmer finally stopped groaning, and the free flow of blood ceased as well. Damn, Shep thought. At least he'd had enough to last till dinner. Looking around, it seems as if they hadn't even started making his lunch anyway, and it seemed like they weren't to any time soon. Babe walked over to the wife and nudged her face. 
I think she might be dead. He nudged her once more just to make sure he was right. Her eyes popped open and she gave him a funny, crazed look. The eyes themselves were completely white and blood dribbled from the corners. Babe didn't like that look at all and backed away, growling the way Shep had taught him. It seemed like the right thing to do. I think we ought to go, Shep suggested. I have a funny feeling about all this. Chapter 2. Quackers Nearly Quokes Shep and Babe came bounding out of the house, running from the semi-clutches of Mrs. Farmer, and noticed that the master was still swinging his wife's hand wildly, although to be fair it looked like he'd also had a bit of a nibble from the wet end as he made his way over to the main gate. Talk about biting the hand that feeds you, Shep thought, fully aware of the irony, having been warned against just that action by the master's wife when he was a mere pup. One rule for one. Babe had been right with his warning about the approaching people. A group of half a dozen or so had walked up the road, mumbling to themselves and each other, and now their progress had been halted by the closed gate. They appeared to be having problems with the latch mechanism as their dexterity looked somewhat limited. They had so far failed to realise that the footpath gate right next to them was, in fact, wide open. Small wonder that humans weren't at the top of the food chain, Babe thought somewhat arrogantly, especially considering his own IQ, and he walked over to the gate to help them. With his teeth, he easily tugged at the rope with a knot in its end that the master had made especially for him. No, came a call from behind. Shep ran over and nuzzled the pig away from his saliva-covered rope, but it was too late, and they watched helplessly as the gate swung noisily open. The horde, or small group of zombified humans as it actually was, lurched forward their way now unimpeded. Splitting up, they began chasing the poor chickens around, the human stiff limbs and awkward gait assuring the farmyard birds and their families that they were perfectly safe as long as they kept moving. Seeing their way clear through the open gate, the chooks took their long away to chance and made a break for freedom. The bastard farmer may have clipped their wings, but unless he was willing to take their legs off at the knees, they were going to get clear of captivity once and for all. This great day would be remembered for generations, or until they found something interesting to peck at. The green fields and wilds of the nearby woodlands were beckoning. Shep breathed a sigh of relief as he watched the flock of Gallus Gallus Domesticus make its slow, erratic and pecking way up the road. Jeez, Shep thought, irritated at the fleeing group as they stopped to peck at something only they might identify as food. If that's making a break for freedom, I'd hate to see a leisurely stroll. At this rate, the little buggers will never get clear of the clutches of these strange humans. With no small amount of irritation building up inside him, he ran up the road and chased the chickens away and into the fields where the little pea brains would be better suited to staying hidden among the crops. Babe had followed him and was barking, well, snort barking at them as if this was some sort of game. His strange utterances were attracting the attention of the humans, some of whom had turned around and were staring strangely in their direction. "'What the fuck are you doing?' Shep asked, his irritation in no way abated. "'I'm doing what you're doing,' Babe said uncertainly. "'And just what is that?' "'Rounding up the chickens,' Shep sighed. "'It's all about rounding up with you, isn't it? "'I thought you were pretty intelligent when I first saw you doing what I do. "'After all, it isn't easy. "'But you just mimic, don't you?' "'Just mimic,' he repeated in the same tone of voice. "'Don't know what you mean,' Babe replied, a little dejected and very uncertain. "'Come on, then. Let's get our friends and get the flock out of here. "'Why are we taking the sheep?' "'Jeez, it's a good thing you got a cute ass, Babe,' Shep retorted, "'running back into the yard, closely followed by the galloping porcine nitwit. "'Goliath had made his lumbering way into the yard "'and was looking around in apprehension at the strange humans. "'What's going on?' he asked Shep, "'his Australian accent coming out as his terror at the unfolding scene increased. "'You're an Aussie?' Shep asked incredulously, applying the brakes, so he skidded to a halt next to the huge beast. "'I'd have never guessed.' "'I've had elocution lessons,' he explained, courtesy of my mother. "'Bless her dark old heart. "'The crazy mare thought I wouldn't get on unless I had this crazy Cornish Mary Jack accent. "'She was right. "'Now I'm a successful, soon-to-be-retired dray horse. "'I hate to think what would have happened to me otherwise. "'I'd probably be pulling a rag-and-bone cart instead of a cartload of shit on a farm.' Shep peered at him to see if he was being ironic or even sarcastic, but there was nothing, only a vacant stare. Right, Shep muttered uncertainly. He shook himself in an effort to slough off the effects of the crazy pills someone must have slipped him. The world was looking way too bizarre just now. We have to get out of here, Shep continued. I think everyone's gone mad. Where's Quackers? At that moment, Selma landed on the dumb beast's back and squawked in alarm. Her eyelashes were flapping like semaphore flags. They've got Quackers, she screeched. You have to help him. Babe, still full of enthusiasm, in spite of Shep's cutting words, decided it was time to go on the offensive. Let's go help him, he squealed, and ran off to the barn. Where's he going? Selma asked, a little confused. <sighs> no one really knows, Shep replied, a little shamefaced. He knew what they were all thinking about his dear friend. Changing the subject, he asked where the poor captive duck was. He's in the woodcutting shed out back, she replied quickly, taking off to lead the way. So far the zombies had taken almost no notice of the animals, apart from the odd feeble attempt to capture a chicken. Now they were homing in on the small group of animals with their arms, or arm in Mrs. Farmer's case, outstretched, their salivating mouths making their intentions crystal clear. 
With no further hesitation, the motley group of animals fled the scene, running around and behind the house. Babe had at last caught up with them, having realized he didn't know where, where Quackers actually was being held. Now he felt sheepish, which as a pig was a little strange for him. Together they arrived at the shed and could hear the master's electric saw running at full speed. His hobby of carpentry seemed to have taken on a more visceral aspect, more specifically Quackers' viscera. Salma was flapping around like a headless chicken, only not quite so. Help him, please, she shrieked, beside herself with fear. She'd wanted to be with him unto death, only hoping that their time together would be a little longer than this. I'll go, Babe trumpeted, his bravado coming from his desire to redress his asinine charge into the barn only a few minutes previously. Rising onto his hindquarters, all that was missing was a whinny as he threw himself at the slightly open door. Shep's paw tripped him before he managed to go more than a few feet and he collapsed in a cloud of dust. His embarrassment returned and his face went red with surprise. Don't be soft, sweetie pie, Shep began. You'll only get yourself killed if you charge in there like a bullet a gate. We have to plan this. Goliath interrupted the lover's tiff. I can easily go in there and say, Brackers, you have to go in quietly, without them knowing you're coming, Shep stated, a little afraid that Goliath had been using his massive intellect again. Explain to me how you're going to do it. This, he said simply, his baritone voice booming at full volume. Shep flinched as he realised Goliath was scared out of his wits, but like all good horses who wanted their own charge at the light brigade moment, he would nonetheless face the maddened horde that had crackers in their grasp and were, for some inexplicable reason, using a complex woodworking tool to either frighten him or, well, something unpleasant and probably messy. Before Shep or anyone else could object, Goliath threw himself at the building more or less in the direction of the small entrance that never would have been wide enough for him to fit through a mere moment ago. He disappeared in a cloud of dust, and everyone waited with bated breath as to how the outcome of this somewhat unsubtle approach to rescuing the duck. With a loud creaking noise and a sudden crack as the roof support failed, the building fell in upon itself and the friends gasped in horror of it all. Oh, the humanity, Babe cried, seeing the turmoil his enormous friend had created. Could anyone survive this Armageddon, he wondered silently. The dust settled slowly, and at last they could see the outcome of the rescue attempt. Two humans, quite unrecognisable in the dust, lay writhing and moaning bloodily on the floor with solid oak beams pinning them down. From the flatness of most of their bodies, Shep guessed they ought to be more still than this. Peering more closely, on the table they could see quackers lying quite still and smeared in bright red blood. He was groaning quietly. With a despairing screech, Salma flew like a shapely dart to his side and began to weep. What have they done to you? she bowled rhetorically. Her eyes wandered over the bloody mess that was his body. Hearing the carping voice that he loved more than life itself, his head turned sideways and looked up into her staring eyes. I know your face, he muttered, a feathered wing brushing her tears away. She gave one mighty sob and looked down at her dying partner. Oh, my darling, darling baby, she whispered. I had hoped we would live longer together. Why shouldn't we? he asked, a little confused. Are you flying south? You're dying, she whispered, astounded at his strength and denial of the obvious. Yes, well, everyone dies at some time or another, he agreed sagely. With what appeared to be a great effort, he stood on his webbed feet, the slippery blood covering him, accounting for part of the struggle. Salma stopped crying, stunned at his strength of character, his last ditch effort to stand up. Oh, my brave hero, you don't have to get up. I'll stay by your side until the end, she protested, using her wings to force him back down onto his back. Yes, but don't we have to get out of here, he argued, sounding a little petulant. Salma was beginning to get irritated at his dogmatic desire to stand up when he was dying. All she wanted to do was nurse him until the end. That was a dignified and romantic thing to do, and she certainly didn't want to argue about it. As a result, she pinned him down, her wings getting bloody from the gore that covered her unfortunate avian lover. Quackers finally gave up the unequal struggle. Shep came over and finally delivered the tiebreaker. He licked the blood on Quackers' feathers and thought for a moment. He sniggered at a joke he remembered about a lab test and a CAT scan, and was rewarded by a wet slap from Salma's wing. A little respect, if you please, she commanded. Yeah, whatever, Shep replied. Babe, come over here and tell me what's wrong with this picture. Babe came over and jumped from obstacle to obstacle. He finally managed to get high enough to cast his eagle eye over the scene. He thought for a moment, and then a light bulb went off behind his eyes. Quackers isn't dying, he exclaimed with more than a little relief. And how do you know that? Shep pursued. Quackers has that sarcastic look on his face, like when he thinks I'm not being very clever. The poor pig was always coy when describing his brain power, or lack of. Yes, that, and it's not his blood. Babe gasped in surprise. I didn't know you had medical training. I hope you've enjoyed listening to the first two chapters of Babe, Pig in the Apocalypse. More chapters can be found on my website at www.zombies-worldwide.com or www.david-k-roberts.com Please also feel free to check out other books I have written, a selection of zombie and science thrillers. 
For those of you who did not know the lab test and CAT scan joke, I have reproduced it here for your, what's the word, enjoyment I think. For those of you who don't like it, I'd like to say I'm sorry, but I won't.